Alfred Krzybski Memorial Lecture. Some of the previous speakers include Buckminster Fuller, Abraham Maslow, Jacob Bronowski, Gregory Bateson, George Steiner, Neil Postman, Ben Bova, Alan Walker-Reed, Jerome Bruner, Albert Ellis, Steve Allen, Nicholas Johnson, and Robert Anton Wilson. I think that the name Douglas Rushkoff does not seem out of place added on this list. Doug is an author, teacher, and documentarian. His 10 best-selling books on new media and popular culture have been translated into over 30 languages. They include Screenagers, which we have on sale back there. Remember I made that point earlier? Uh, and he'll sign it. Um, media Virus and Coercion, which won the MEA's Marshall McLuhan Book Award. Rushkoff also wrote the highly acclaimed novels Ecstasy Club and Exit Strategy, the graphic novel Club Zero G, and the monthly Vertigo, Vertigo comic book, which just came to a conclusion, Testament. He's written and hosted two award-winning frontline documentaries, The Merchants of Cool and The Persuaders. He's advisor to the United Nations Commission on World Culture. He's on the board of, of directors of the Media Ecology Association and also for the Center for Cognitive Liberty and Ethics. And he was a founding member of Technorealism. He's been awarded senior fellowships by the Markle Foundation, the Center for Global Communications, and the International University of Japan. Perhaps especially fitting for this year of anniversaries, he was the winner of the Media Ecology Association's first Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement in Public Intellectual Activity. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you the 56th Annual Alfred Krzybski Memorial Lecturer, Douglas Rushkoff. It's an honor that the, the honor is, is beyond words, so I won't even try to express that. What I will try to express, this is a really interesting group of people. <laughs> and an interesting mix. I mean, the, the, the half over here came because your members are associated with the Institute of General Semantics. and pay dues and things and get newsletters and the other half of these people got a or another half got a probably a Facebook message from Jeff from Jeff Newell who's a friend of mine and word buzzed through the networks and and they came and it was two very different paths to the same event and of course, they wouldn't have been able to come were it not for the generosity of this group, right? You guys, by paying your dues and paying whatever, 90 bucks, 100 bucks it was, to come to this dinner, made this possible. So instead of seeing your contribution as the privilege to get this thing, you decided your contribution was about the privilege to share this thing. Right, which is very different. I mean, I've spoken in synagogues where they won't let anybody in if they're not members because they haven't paid the dues and the members have to think that they're getting something for being members, right? But what you guys understood, guys and gals, what you guys and gals understood was that by sharing your event, you don't lose anything. You gain something. You gain value by sharing this thing. Right? It actually, you increase your value by sharing. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Not just as the father of a three-year-old, who is now teaching the virtue of sharing, but as someone, <laughs> as someone witnessing a society wobble on the brink of what could almost be a collapse 
for its inability to understand that very basic truth. And as I see it, this is a problem of programming, not a problem of circumstance. I think this is not because of a, an intrinsic scarcity, but a manufactured scarcity that we have now come to accept as given circumstances because we do not have the programmatic, linguistic, spiritual, and intellectual tools to dissemble this illusion. I believe that the people that created this illusion have long since left the building. <laughs> and those who are operating the machinery that they set in motion do not themselves know that this machinery is arbitrarily concocted to promote agendas that we are no longer cognizant of. And where I feel an overlap with general semantics is in seizing the technologies, both physical and, and uh, mental psychological, that we need to reorient ourselves to the world as co-creators rather than simply uh, heirs. So where I'd start, where I would come to understand this, would be the experience of a gamer. Right? If you think about a kid getting a video game, the first way they play this game is out of the box as it was given to them. Right? They play the video game, they shoot the dragons and the aliens, and they go through all these levels and do whatever they can to play the game the way the game was given to them. Then eventually, they'll get stuck somewhere in that game. And what does a kid do when he gets stuck in the game? He goes online, he finds out the cheat codes for the game, and now he comes back and plays that game with infinite ammunition, with special shields, with the ability to walk through walls, or go up an extra level. Is he still playing the game? Yes, he's still playing the game, but he's playing the game from outside the frame of the original game. He's playing the game now as a cheater, as someone who's a, aware of the rules and understand that he does not, no longer has to follow the rules of the game. Right? He can play the game his way as an individual because it's more interesting to him to get to the next level than to figure out how to get through this particular trap. Right, so now he plays the game with infinite ammunition and, and all his stuff, and now he can get all the way to the end of the game and win, whatever that means. Rescue the thing, get through, he's done. Which in some sense is the saddest part, right? The game is over. But what does he do then if he's really into this game and really likes it? He goes back online, he gets the programming tools for this game, right, with, with the modification set, and he makes his own mod of the game, his own version of this game. Right, so now instead of running around in the dungeons of doom, he can turn those, those corridors into the corridor of his high school. And he can play and turn other characters into his friends and shoot them up there. Or he can even get more strange with the game and decide, well, instead of shooting people, what if we have magic wands and turn them into other things? Right? He can now make his own mod, his own modification of the game. Now, why does he do that? Does he do that just because he wants to play his own version of the game? No. He's going to take his mod, his version of the game that he's programmed, he's going to put it up online in the hopes that other people will download it. Yeah. Right? Because now he wants to share what he's done. Yes, he wants to get the status for doing it. It's going to create reputation and social value. And, you know, and, you know, and, and maybe someday you know, the game company is going to say, oh, look at the great mod this kid made. Let's hire him to be a professional gamer or to be a game designer. Who knows? But the impulse when he's finished this game, for him, mastery means being able to create a mod of this game that other people are going to like and then share it with them. Right? Get it up and get 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 downloads. So he's moved from being a player 
who accepted the rules as they were written, as just gospel truth, to a cheater who understood that the rule set was for certain people who wanted to follow those rules, but not for him, to a, an author of sorts who is now using this game to create other kinds of experiences for other people. He's become a sharer, right, of his perspective, of his way of working with this game. And of course, that's not even the last level he could get to. The last level would be to learn the code through which a game is made and actually design his own game from the bottom up, to create his own game, to become a real game designer. Right? He's sort of an author, but he's using the tools, like we would use Microsoft Word or any other sort of construction set out there to build a game out of this guy's tools. Well, what about if I make the tool set itself? What if I make the game that now other people mod? What am I? I'm like this game master. I'm a world creator. I'm a rule maker. I believe that our civilization moved through these same, really same exact stages. We started if, 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 and I would argue that, and this is because of my, my bias as a media theorist, but I would argue that new media have been responsible for each of our shifts, for each of our evolutions, each of our sort of game stages. So before even the invention of text, or discovery of text, depending on your perspective, before the invention of text, People lived in a world with rules that just were, right? Time was circular. You sacrificed your animals and your kids to the gods. You just did whatever you could to hope the rain's going to come next year, my wife's going to be fertile, the soil's going to come up. It either worked or it didn't, right? You didn't really have any impact, any influence over the way the world worked. It just worked. That guy Pharaoh over there, he's God. That's just it. You didn't even, you didn't consider things like class mobility. I mean, you didn't even think about that. It was, this is just the way things are. You didn't make an agreement. You were born into a world that had pre-existing conditions that just were. These are immutable. With the invention of text, we got the entire Judeo-Christian tradition. With the invention of text, all of a sudden, our relationship to those rules changed. Right? Whether you look in, the, in Genesis at God speaking to Abraham and telling them, saying, you will be a nation of priests. And you think about, what does that mean? Who were priests in Abraham's day? Priests were people who could read and write. That's why they call them hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics means priestly writing. You will be a nation of priests means you are going to be a nation of people who can read and write. Now, why would, uh, why would God in this story talk about that at this point? Because the religion that came from it, Judaism, the Torah that came from it was a contract. It was written as a covenant, a contract. What is a contract? A contract is an agreement to follow the rules. This is from player to cheater. This is from player to cheater. Moses goes in the desert with his brother-in-law Yithro, and they write down the rules. Well, we have a judge and a head judge, maybe this one and that one. How's it going to work? People are going to write the rules through which they are going to organize society. And they write it as a covenant with the original rule maker, with the original game designer. Right? You're supposed to follow the rules, but you don't have to. You know. It's like you're supposed to do this. If you don't do this, it even says all over Torah. You don't do this, I'm going to make your fields get bad. I'm going to do this. You have a perfect right in Torah not to follow the rules. Just You're going to just be damned for it, right? God's going to hate you. If you can't hear, whatever. But you're at that stage now where now as a human being, you can consciously follow these rules. And ideally, if you're a rabbi, you can participate in the, in the writing, the interpretation of the rules around it. Now, the next big, big media invention was the printing press. Right? And with the printing press now, everybody has their own copy of these rules. 
right? Instead of sitting in the town square, listening to the rabbi read the covenant to you all, you go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Now you've got your own. So the gentleman sits in his study, reading his Bible, going, oh, well, I think this rule actually means something different. I think this rule no longer applies. Or I think this one... This is how we got Protestantism, was with people actually being able to have their own individual perspective, their own mod, if you will, on the rules. What applies, what doesn't? What of his Jews should say, what of halacha, what of the law do we still have to follow? You know, do we still have to stone priestesses to death when we find out they've used a Ouija board? Or, you know, can we adapt the law? Well, we're changing the law, right? If I'm still a good Jew, but I haven't stoned the sorceress, what does that mean? It means I've made a mod, right? I've modified this. And then finally, we get the computer and the networks, right? Which now allow us to sort of build something else, which now allow us to at least in, in for now, in, in separate subworlds, we can be God ourselves. We can create worlds, whether they're second life or simulations or game environments, or even what was that God game? Uh, 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 is that one called? No, the one where you have all these tribes of people worshiping you. Do you remember that one? Black and white. Black and white, yeah. That was great. That was a great one. It's like the, it was a God game where you actually are God. And you have all these little tribes of people making fires and praying to you. And, and they took it really literally. Um, the problem is, I feel like we don't actually seize the capability of the media that's being offered us or only a few of us do, right? And then we don't share it. Like, I, I'm happy that with the invention of text, we moved from being obeyers of the law to hearers of the law, to people who went to the town square and heard the rules that we are agreeing to live by. But we got the invention of text. No one learned to read. People learned to hear. Rabbis knew how to read. <coughs> They weren't even really allowed to add to it. You know, they were sofas, they were scribes. So we get the invention of text. We don't learn to read, we learn to hear. We get the printing press. What happens? Do we get a, a civilization of writers? No, we get an elite of writers who have access to printing press and a civilization of readers. We get the printing press and we stay one step behind the capability that the technology is offering us. And then finally we get and God bless it, I love it, of course, computers and our internets. And what capability do we have as a people? Are we programmers? No, we are writers. We are writers. We are free to blog to our heart's content. Right? I can blog in the window that Google-owned blog gives me to write in. I do not know how to program. I mean, I used to kind of basic and Fortran, some of the old, the ancient languages. But I, like everybody else, of this great computer revolution, we have not seized, we have not seized the capability of program. We've seized the capability of writing. So we now all have the capability that we were granted by our technologies 400 years ago. While we're busy outsourcing programming to India and China or wherever people actually know how to do code anymore. And we don't even, for the most part, consider the biases of the interfaces that we're using. We just want to get that new iPhone. You know, and if you're in Slashdot or some sort of now esoteric programming part, you think about, well, what does it mean that you have to do, you have to buy a piece of software through the Apple Store and you're not allowed to trade person to person? What? And we don't really go there. Now, it's enjoyable, the sort of the childlike confidence that some elite who knows the technology takes care of us, right? It's nice, you get a book and oh, some important people wrote this book, so now I can sit and read it. But it's the job, it's the self-appointed job of the media elite, and I'm not talking some left-right Fox News versus MSNBC thing, I'm talking about the people who actually know how to use the stuff, to 
really coerce us, to persuade us to regress to a lower level, to regress to the level before the one we're at, as opposed to actually gaining the higher tool. The thing that excited me about the computer revolution, about the internet, about, we were talking about this before, about early rave culture and even the, the psychedelic revival, the thing that got me reading the people on the list of other lecturers from Bucky Fuller through Robert Anton Wilson was the idea that the world we live in is open for discussion, that our world is, there are some pre-existing conditions, but there are also many, many mutable ones and that I feel like we're living in a world where we are mistaking a hell of a lot of software for hardware. There's a lot of stuff that we think is written in stone, which has been written by somebody in stone. <laughs> Big deal. And my worry as I read the minuscule portion of the general semantics literature that I've read, and worse, as I look at the way general semantics ideas have trickled down to my culture as neurolinguistic programming and Est and Tony Robbins and The Secret. This notion that understanding programming means understanding how to reprogram the self. And maybe it's because I'm getting old. I'm not interested in reprogramming myself anymore. I'm interested in reprogramming the world. <laughs> and not personally, but with other people. I'm sick of this, uh, and I guess Anna Freud was the best at expressing it, this notion that the way to and Anna Freud, from Anna Freud right through Werner Erhard, that the way to substantively change your experience of life is to change your experience of life. <laughs> As if my subjective perspective is the problem here. I'll accept that it's part of the problem here. But my subjective perspective is also the result of living within a system of rules, within a system of agreements to which most of us have not agreed. They are simply here as a matter of course. We don't like it, we don't know how they got here, but they seem unchangeable, so let me just work on my little piece of that experience and hang on and hope for the best. Some people get like one notch ahead and they think, oh, I'm gonna learn NLP and all this, and I'm not gonna program myself anymore, I'm gonna program someone else. <laughs> right, and that's how you get stuck in that sort of, I'm okay, you're okay, he's not okay, I'm okay, that conundrum. Well, if it's not me, it's her. What if it's neither of us? What if it's not me or her, but the system of rules that we've agreed are just there as a matter of fact? What if it's the given circumstances? And what if the given circumstances have not, are not given, or were simply given by someone else who thought they were given circumstances? What I'm interested in is how do we achieve the agency to change the world? How do we gain access to the tools and language through which we can begin the conversation and re-engineering of our world? And I believe that the reason why we don't have access, it goes back pretty directly to the Renaissance. And that's why I spent a lot of time studying the Renaissance. And now that I've studied it, it looks really different to me than it did when I was taught it. Right? I was taught that the Renaissance was this great time, golden age, everything worked out, we got cities and nations and perspective painting, and we started using advanced currencies and double 
double, uh, uh, two column ledgers, and we wouldn't have had the industrial age or the enlightenment or even the individual and voting and personal rights and all that without that great renaissance. <laughs> Now, what really, ha what really happened during the Renaissance? What really happened during the Renaissance was a massive centralization of power, of value creation, and of, of idea creation. And it's funny, the thing that we're going through today, this, this financial crash that seems to have just happened, this thing that just happened, it didn't just happen. This didn't just happen, right? Stuff doesn't just happen, some stuff just happens, but this didn't just happen. This is a direct result of programs that were set in place, I would argue, during the Renaissance, sold to us through the Industrial Age, and now, well, accelerated by computers, but obeyed blindly by a civilization that has forgotten what happened. If you look back at what really happened during the Renaissance, what we got was a disconnection from terra firma. We got a disconnection from the real world. To make the point really briefly, place, this place that we are, became this other thing known as property. That's a big flip. Right? We were cordoning off different zones of land and all. Place became property. That's, that's a big one. And it really did happen then. The other thing we got in the Renaissance was the corporation. A corporation is a really interesting entity. What is the corporation? It's a covenant. It's a charter. Right? So now people used to do business. Business is no problem with business and commerce. That's what you do. I make stuff, I give it to you, it has value for you, you do something for me, or I, you do something for him, then you do something for me, and we make a currency so that we can not have to just trade back and forth, but with a third party and a fourth. That's all cool. What was the corporation? Was it really so that, oh, now we can do more business and do business better? No, the corporation was established because in the Renaissance, the aristocracy, the monarchy, was losing power and money. Right? There was a rising merchant class. The people Bucky Fuller used to call the great pirates. Read Operation, uh, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth is a great description of these guys. There was basically a merchant class that was making more money than the aristocracy. That's why we start, decided to make high fashion clothes, have less, be less gaudy, because rich people could no longer afford to keep up with the poor people who could dress more garishly than they could. They were getting richer. Because, well, for all sorts of reasons, but basically because the royalty was landlocked, they were stuck with whatever their dad had, and the merchant class was out there now shipping, getting resources, and doing all sorts of stuff. Now, the problem that the merchant class had was they were living in a true free market, right? Your family business might last a voyage or two before pirates got you or a fire, then your business goes down and someone else takes over. So the rich merchant class had a problem too. They wanted to know how to lock in their gains, right? Capital preservation, as your Smith Barney broker would call it. They were looking for how to lock in their gains. And that's where the kings and the, and the, the aristocracy had something they could offer. They could offer a charter. The corporate charter was not really about growing businesses. The corporate charter was about locking down finances where they were. I am the king, and you're my friend who's really successful right now in the, the gold mining business out in Africa. Now, you're getting richer than me. You're getting more powerful than me. How am I going to get you to respect me even when you're richer than me? How am I going to get you to respect my, my throne? I'm going to charter your company. I'm going to give you an official an officially mandated monopoly over your industry. How about that? Now you don't have to worry about competition anymore. Why? No one else is allowed to go for gold. You're it. And what are you going to give me? Give me some shares in the company. Right? And of course, all that 
what I'm going to mandate as limited liability for anything bad that happens. Right? We're only, we're only liable for the amount of our investment. Okay? That's it. It's in the rules. Don't worry about it. Now what are we doing? We're not actually even, you and I, running a company anymore. We're investors in a company, and we're pretty safe. Right? We can hire other people to do all the stuff. What happened in the Renaissance as business, as, as craftspeople grew into business people, what did they really do? They stopped doing the things they do. Right? If you were a shoemaker and you made great shoes, what was your next step? To become a manager of other shoemakers. Right? And what kind of shoemakers do you want? This is where the Renaissance logic comes in. Do you want really good, highly skilled, trained shoemakers? No. You want the shoemakers who can follow your steps as cheap as possible. You want Home Depot illegal immigrant <laughs> shoemakers who you can pick up in the morning, get them to make your shoes, and if one of them gets sick or dies or gets angry or doesn't listen to you, he's gone and he's replaceable within the hour. When you do business in the Renaissance fashion, what you want is to separate yourself from the doing of the thing as much as possible, get as high above it as possible. So rather than just running a bunch of people in a shoe shop, I want to run 20 shoe shops. And rather than running 20 shoe shops, let me do 22 shops and 20 dress shops and 20 of those. You want to move up and up. As you move up, you move further and further away from the actual doing of a thing. And the people doing the thing move further and further down. Right? So they're less and less skilled so that you can eventually have an industrial age and replace them as much as possible with machines and get people, rather than to get machines to work at the pace of people, you can get people to work at the pace of machines. How fast are you going? You're supposed to go this fast because the machine is moving that fast along the way. So what, we're, what we get is an alienation from experience, an alienation from the real, and instead allegiance to a rule system, a rule system that says, I am the king, he is my chartered corporation, it's his job to extract value from my colonies and to bring it back. And it's your job as the colonist to get screwed, right? <laughs> I'm allowed to extract yourself. Oh, but by the way, this is American Revolution history, you gotta get the cotton and give it all to him, but you're not allowed to make clothes out of your cotton. Why isn't he allowed to make clothes out of his cotton? Because you ship back the cotton to the home country, we make the clothes, give it back to you, and now you have to buy it from us. And that's the law. Why is that the law? Because if he makes clothes, then he has created value. The equation is for us to extract value, not for you to create value. Any value that he creates is value that we didn't get. So you've got to be as unskilled as possible. We just want your stuff. And once slavery was illegal, then we'll use the steam engine to dig down there and get that stuff instead. Thanks anyway. Now, the other great inventions in the Renaissance, one of them was centralized currency. And that's a real interesting one today. Most of us think of money as real. And even those of us who don't think of money as real, we still think of money as money, right? And as your great patriarch would say, once you're saying money is money, you know money is not money, right? <laughs> money is not money. Money is a money. It's a kind of money. It's one of many monies. Back before the Renaissance in the late Middle Ages, the much maligned late Middle Ages, when people were so healthy and worked so little and ate so much that women were taller in England in the late Middle Ages than at any time in history until the 1980s. Why is that? Because they had a really good economy. Why is that? Because they didn't use only centralized currency. They didn't really use it at all. What people used in the late Middle Ages was something called local currency. Local currency worked very differently from the money we use today. Local currency, the way you got it, is you would grow a bunch of grain, you'd stick it in a bag, you'd bring it to the grain store, and the grain store would weigh it, he'd say, oh, that's 50 pounds of grain. Here's a receipt for 50 pounds of grain. Now, I would take this receipt and buy stuff with it. 
because you know what it's worth. And even if you don't need the grain, you know this is 50 pounds of grain worth of money. Now, the interesting thing about these local currencies is they actually lost value over time. Why? The grain store needed to be paid. There were rats and there was liquid and, and, and spoilage and mold. So every few months, my 50 pounds of grain would become 40 pounds of grain and 30 pounds of grain because there was actually less of it. So what does that do to the bias of this money? It makes you want to spend it as fast as possible. Right? You've got this, you know it's going to turn to 40, so what are you going to do? Buy something else. So this money is circulating. Circulating really fast, moving around. Everybody's spending. So what does that mean? Everybody's producing. You're spending on anything. Babysitting. Whatever. i got to spend this stuff. That's why we got cathedrals in late Middle Ages. The late Middle Age cathedrals, those were not the... the the, the Vatican writing a check to Chartres and saying, here, go buy, build a nice one, Louis. <laughs> no, it was towns that had so much excess currency. They had created so much excess value that they wanted to store it for tomorrow, for their grandchildren. How did they store it for their grandchildren? By building monuments that future pilgrims would come and visit. That's what that was. They were reinvesting in infrastructure, their windmills, everything was kept. They did something called preventative maintenance, which I know businesses don't understand today, but they actually maintained equipment so that it wouldn't break down, rather than waiting till it broke, because we have the money, let's spend it. Now what's the problem with that? All these towns were rich. Everyone's doing well. Why is that a problem for the king? Because I, the only way I know how to make money is by extracting it from you guys. So what kings did, and France in particular is a great example of it, they made local currency illegal. No more. You're not allowed to use that. You have to use this other stuff called coin of the realm. That's my coin, right, that I produce. And how does coin of the realm work? How does it work today? A central bank creates this money. How? By lending it into existence. That's how money happens, right? The money you have in your pocket is not even money, it's debt. This is debt. How is it lent into existence? A guy, let's say you want to start a business. Now you're in modern times. You're no longer a friend of the king, <laughs> friend of the banker. You want to start a business? All right, the central bank, through another bank, through another bank, through another bank, each getting interest on the money, will lend you $100,000. But what you have to do, <coughs> is in 10 years, you've got to pay back $300,000 instead, okay? Because that's the way interest works. We'll give you the money, but the way we're going to make money off this, because we're part of that whole same group that the king was part of before. We make money by making money, right? You're going to have to give us $200,000 extra when you pay us back. Where are you going to get that other $200,000? From some other poor sucker who borrowed $100,000. From two of them. Those two have to go out of business for you to pay me back the money. Competition was born. Right? Now business is a competitive landscape, rather a scarce landscape, rather than an abundant landscape. Money is not something that gets grown into existence with the grain each year. Money is something that I divvy out and has to be paid back. Money is a scarce resource now, rather than a public utility. That's a very different bias. The only way for those other two people not to go out of business is for them to find other people who borrow more money, and so on, and so on. Which is why the business has to keep growing. That's why the market has to get bigger. That's why you're not allowed to have a sustainable business in a centrally banked economy. There is no such thing as a sustainable business. It has to grow. Because there's more and more to pay back. Because we lived and live in a world where the need for money to grow is actually a more highly valued pre-existing condition than the need of people to have a good time or engage with each other or eat or live a sustainable life. We think and build in a way biased towards the needs of money, which is really just an artifact of Renaissance era chartered corporations. This stuff to keep money growing. That's why we got mass production, to keep money growing, because we've got to make more stuff 
in less time so people can buy more things. It's got to grow or we're not going to pay back the loans. The debt clock's getting bigger. Now, the problem with mass production is what? I'm now no longer buying oats from Tom. I used to buy my oats from Tom. I like Tom. He lives in my town. Actually, he does. And I do, but he doesn't really make oats. But if he's the oat maker in my town, I go to him, I buy his oats. Right? If his oats are not good, I go to Tom, Tom, your oats were bad, I got sick. And he's got more than a irate customer as his problem. Because I am the pharmacist in Tom's town. I mix Tom's wife's medication. And if I'm dying with a stomach ache from his bad oats or bloated, I'm not, I'm not mixing this thing right, he's in trouble. Right? We are codependent, and codependency should never have been a bad word or 12-step program. Codependency is a good thing, not a bad thing. We are codependent. He's not Walmart who's just going to lose my business. Right? He is someone in my town who is going to lose my skill, my ability to participate productively, my ability to add value to his life. Likewise, I'm not going to mix bad drugs or my oats might be bad. Now, once we're mass producing our oats, instead of it being Tom, who I know, who I have a relationship with, who we go to PTA meetings together, now it's a big box, a cardboard box of oats put in front of me. I have got no relationship with those oats. This is where branding came about. Branding came about to recreate and simulate the relationship I had with Tom, right? If you put a Quaker on those box of oats, <laughs> right now I look at, the, we all like Quakers, right? They don't really believe anything in particular. They're just nice. They talk, they're conversational. You know, it's a sweet, sweet group. And he's got a board on him over there, a mole or something. He's not perfect, but he's friendly. We trust him. Sorry, Tom. I have a new relationship with this with this character. Now, how do you get me to have a relationship with this character? How do these corporations do that? That's mass marketing, right? By creating this brand. Now, how do you get that image to me? How do you create a relationship? So I have a relationship with that Quaker before the oats even get there? Mass media, right? Mass production led to mass marketing led to mass media. Mass media did not happen because Lucille Ball was sitting in her cabana saying, I want to reach the world with my comedy. Right? Mass media happened because mass national brands needed to communicate their mythologies to us so we would buy cardboard boxes instead of Tom. But on each step along the way, we're also further alienated from one another, further isolated. We are, we are, we are dehumanized by mass production, working at our machines. We are alienated by mass marketing, relating to a Quaker picture instead of Tom. And we are ultimately isolated by our technologies, by our media technologies. Right? When we forgot our first TV, there was one TV in the living room. Right? By the time I grew up, we had a television in every single room with our own narrow-casted cable channel marketing to each one of us. Why? Television does not want a group audience. Television wants you alone and vulnerable and sad. Why? <laughs> What's the message of TV? <coughs> Right? Buy this product and you will have friends. Buy these jeans and you will get sex. Right? That's what the commercial... Find a, any blue jeans commercial, what does it say? Buy these jeans and you will get sex. Now, what if you're sitting on the couch watching that blue jeans commercial with your girlfriend? Are you the appropriate target audience for that? No, I wear these jeans and I have sex. No, they need me to be alone. The bias of the medium is towards isolating me because the bias of the medium is the bias of its original purpose, which is to market, which is to market, which is to isolate. And then out of this culture, right, we get our wonderful rebirth of GS, general semantics, in the form of the self-improvement movement, right? So we can go to Esalen, where Maslow himself spoke about how to move up the hierarchy of needs to <laughs> self-actualization. I'm going to self. I'll talk to you all later. I'm going to go over here and self-actualize. <laughs> when was the self born? In the Renaissance, of course. That's when we got the self. That's when we got Faustus is really the, the, the sort of the turning point in literature. When we start thinking of the individual, 
It's beautiful we got the individual. Perspective painting was invented because now we understood an individual perspective on something. That's what we got. The Vesuvian man, right? It's the individual. That guy, remember him? And it led to wonderful things. We got the Enlightenment. We got one man, one vote. We got property rights. But eventually the individual kind of devolved into the consumer, which kind of devolved into the shareholder, which kind of getting mixed in with some bad Rand Corporation poker theory <laughs> led us to believe that each human being behaves in a perfectly self-interested way to maximize value for himself. That's sort of the way the theories of economics are based on the idea of, a, of, of utility maximization performed by individuals in their self-interest. But of course, if you work at any credit card company and go into their behavioral finance department, you'll find out that the way they construct their ads and pitches is based on their knowledge that none of us is a rational economic actor. We behave completely emotionally and with our long-term economic interests and value out of the picture. And the fact that we are currently, I would argue, wasting our best mind and culture technologies still on the self is to miss the clarion call of this age, which is that the self does not exist. There is no self, just as selfishness doesn't really work, neither does the self. The self is manufactured conceit. The self is a conceit manufactured during the Renaissance to promote a civilization of competition. Because if we are all competing for resources that we believe are scarce, then the people who have set themselves up as those who can dole out those resources will maintain their power. And the banking system that we are living with today, the speculative economy, which has now grown much, much bigger than the real economy, still dominates our perspective on what is economic health. Are we doing better? I don't know. Check CNBC to see what the Dow Jones Industrial Average is. And as this crash happens, I find myself and my friends in a bizarre, almost Y2K survivalist wish fulfillment, almost wanting the thing to crash because deep down we know we've grown addicted, dependent in a sick way on something which isn't real, which is more a yoke or a leash than it is a liberator. We, we know deep down it is not real. We understand that those who speculate on the economy are no longer investing in businesses, they're betting on businesses. They are a drag on the system. They are not putting money into production. They are extracting money and resources from production. And that's why the way out is not, and I love Obama as much as anybody, is not to join another great top-down movement. It's not to sign on to a new Aristotelian narrative of struggle, conquest, and victory. It's to bottom up through Facebook or some other means. It's if you have value, to share it. And if you want value, to come take it. It's to actually begin to reconnect to other people, to terra firma, to the activities you do, to the competencies in your, in your, to your own skill set, rather than taking this, this bizarre fake carrot of working in order not to have to work anymore, <laughs> having a career in order to get to retire, where now, I mean, so maybe we're not so Christian anymore, but the 401k plan has become the new salvation at the end of the line. And the way to get there, I would argue, is to adopt an open source perspective on the world we live in, a programmer's perspective on the world. Not to just write about what bothers us, but to, as Ross Perot used to say, pop the hood and fix it. <laughs>
Does everyone have to know how to be a computer programmer? No. But everybody has to at least know that the computer has been programmed. When I used to take computer in junior high school and high school, they taught us how to work a computer, how to program a computer. Now when you take computer in junior high school or high school, you learn Microsoft Office. You learn the applications that have been created by corporate America for you to get a job in corporate America as it exists now, rather than you to get the tools to rebuild an economy, to rebuild a society in the image that you see. And when we do get that glimpse, that moment of, oh, I get it, it is all open source. We think, how am I gonna make myself and my experience, how am I gonna make me better? And that's not the object of the game anymore. The object of the game is to find the other people that have seen that little dashboard and collaborate with them on, on reprogramming this whole darn thing on, go back to Bucky Fuller, on re-engineering. He always looked at the problems of the world as design problems, not fundamental problems. Redesign. So I'm, I'm a fan of GS, don't get me wrong. I'm a fan of GS. I think it's cool stuff, I think these are great technologies. And I think they can be applied in any of a number of ways. And I think we're finally at a stage as a civilization where we can understand how to apply them collectively towards our, our mutual problems and towards changing the landscape instead of just the people on it. So I would argue in closing, don't change the self. Don't change the self. The self does not exist. Change the world instead. Okay, that's enough for me. Thank you.